do your intro and then we'll go to Nate. Great. So you'll All hear right. me when I'm supposed so to. So good, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this morning for the third of our lab walk through live event episodes. Uh, I'll just very quickly say that today we are up in the sixth floor of the library building here at Concordia University. We're joined by Nathan Brown, associate professor in the Department of English and the founder of the Center for Expanded Poetics or CEP. And so on that note, I'll straight away pass it over to Nathan so that he could tell us about his current project. So over to you, Nathan. Hi there, I'm Nathan Brown, Canada Research Chair in Poetics, and this is the Center for Expanded Poetics. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary research lab, which is focused on the study of relationships between poetry and the other arts, uh, such as architecture, visual arts, cinema, uh, and also the sciences. Um, so I can show you around the lab. So the idea of the lab is um, to have two different spaces one of which is for study of texts and objects and poetic traditions, artistic traditions that already exist, um, and also for the screening of films or the screening of visual works that students might make. Um, and as you can see, there's, a, there's an extensive library of 20th and 21st century poetry in particular, but also books on the visual arts, um, on conceptual art, um, on cinema, et cetera. Um, so this is used as a, a study space and also as a space for uh, seminars and guest speakers and a film screening space. Um, there's a large touch screen here uh, that we can use to study um, digital texts um, and that we can also use to model the projects that we make in the center. Um, and I'll just show you the, the second room and then we can talk a little bit about um, the research that we've been doing. So this is the, the project room. Um, and we have a few different pieces of equipment that allow us to do different things. Uh, this is an archival book scanner. Um, which we've been using to, for example, uh, digitize this uh, modernist journal, Transition, one of the most important uh, journals of the modernist avant-garde. So that's an ongoing project right now. And we've already digitized uh, two journals from the 1960s and 70s, uh, Caterpillar and Sulphur. So that's the way that we sort of study traditions and try to make them available through some of our archival work. Um, the heart of the lab for a while has been the risograph digital duplicator over here, um, which looks like a photocopier, uh, but actually it's a kind of digital screen printer. Um, and it uses these soy-based inks. Um, you can also see the, uh, the print roll right here, the cylinder. Um, and the process of the risograph is that anything that you feed the printer, uh, that you design for the, for the printer, it burns a master sheet of, and it, what it's doing is burning about 600 dots per inch into a master sheet with whatever image or text you put in, and then pressing the ink up through the roller um, onto the medium that you're printing onto. Uh, and so the risograph has been a hub for a lot of collaborative projects. You can see some of the collage works that people have made. You can see this incredible calendar that wasn't made here, but it was made by our collaborator, JP King, who's come and given us a, a risograph workshop. Um, that's an example of, uh, of incredible mastery of, uh, of the capacities of the risograph. Um, and we're also using the risograph to publish our own book series. Um, so this is a book, The Display, by Nora Colin Fulton, who actually is an RA, one of the researchers at the Center for Expanded Poetics. Uh, this is a book by Tanya Luke and Linklater, um, who's an indigenous poet. Uh, and this one is edited by my colleague, Michael Nardone. Um, so Michael and I edit this book series. And um, what we try to do is involve, we try to print books 
by younger scholars or, or younger poets, uh, and often people who sometimes people are affiliated with the CEP, and also maybe um, artists and poets who are more established, like Tanya Lucan Linklater um, or Norbizi Philip. Uh, and so these books are printed right on the risograph. Um, they're designed here at the CEP and printed on the risograph, and then uh, they're bound and distributed by our collaborators at Antiism Books. Um, we also have uh, a 3D printer, um, which is going to be used as a sort of provisional testing printer for a larger sculptural project that we're doing, converting a, a famous modernist poem into a sculptural object. And so I can show you a little bit about that project uh, on the touch screen if you'd like. So the idea then is to, to have a room where we can study things, where we can display things, and then a room where we can produce things that could themselves be studied and displayed. So should I give you some examples? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I mentioned sculpture. Um, and one of the projects that we're in the middle of is this digital translation project to uh, translate, as it were, um, Mallarmé's poem, A Throw of the Dice Will Never Abolish Chance, into a 3D printed sculptural object. Um, but there's also another sculptural project, which is this one uh, done in Needlepoint um, by someone who's been working with the CEP for a long time, also the person who prints our book series, Jessica Bebenek. And this is a sculpture of Placeville Marie, which you can actually see out the window of the CEP right in the center of downtown, a famous uh, curtain wall modernist building um, that, was, uh, that was finished in the 1960s in Montreal. And that became the subject of a whole course that I taught here. So that's a good example of interdisciplinary um, approaches to relationships between the arts. So I can start there by showing you some elements of that project. Um, <laughs> I'll wait until the camera <laughs> comes off. So this was a year long course uh, that I taught in this room. Um, and the idea was to take the architectural form of the Placeville Marie complex in downtown Montreal to study its, um, the social and cultural history of the development of the project, to study the mathematical geometrical architectural form, to study some of the architectural traditions that it draws on and their context within international modernism. And then the idea was also to read volumes of poetry that had something to do with architecture in one way or another, and sometimes use models of architectural form in the way that the poets were working. And then at the end of the course, all the students in the class developed their own projects um, around Placeville Marie. In some way, uh, the, the class was called Plas a Deformation. Um, so in some way, deforming or reforming um, Placeville Marie. So you can see here, we had some uh, cinema projects, um, this project by Alicia Duclo is actually going to be one of the next books that we publish in our document series that I was showing you a moment ago. So she wrote a number of poems and took a, a, a whole bunch of photographs of Placeville Marie, and these are kind of conceptual poems about the relationship between affect theory and modernism. Uh, some more cinema projects, and this was a great project, um, doing sound walks around the city that radiated out from the cruciform structure of Placeville Marie. So kind of poetic, theoretical excursions around Montreal, taking the geometry of the building as a starting point. I'll show you this project that resulted in um, uh, the needlepoint sculpture. So you can see <laughs> Jessica put together this amazing web page, studying the structure of the building, its mathematical determinations, geometrical determinations, in the way, for example, that one might study the meter of a poem, right? The relationship between uh, rhythm, numbers of syllables, structures that, um, that uh, form the poem. Um, so here you can see the process of the work. So it's an exact duplication of um, the geometrical structure of the building and its modular form. And then you can see that Jessica is interested in these kind of quotidian uses then of uh, 
textile arts and arts like needlepoint, which are not thought of as you know, participating in the high modernist tradition, but actually there are lots of um, examples of geometrical and conceptual textile arts that Jessica was also studying. And here you can see the timesheet where she documented all of her work on the project uh, and the different elements of it. There you can see her actually needlepointing at Place Ville Marie um, and studying the history of, uh, of textile works in uh, and after modernism. And all of that then resulted in this incredibly time consuming final product, which is itself a sculptural work, um, but also a kind of quotidian work of, uh, of needlepoint, sort of taking the high modernist um, tradition of architecture and converting it into a work that really has to do with other traditions, in particular of feminist art making. Um, so that was a really fascinating project. Um, I could show you one more example if you'd like. Um, so this is the 3D printing project that we're in the midst of. This. So if you come over here, you can see the, the layout of the poem on the screen. So the importance of uh, Mallarmé's A Throw the Dice Will Never Abolish Chance is that it was one of the first poems to really use the visual space of the page um, as a field for laying out the elements of the poem. So you can see that it moves away from the left margin. We're working here in free verse and also using the field as a space or the page as a space. There's an interesting um, translation of the poem already um, by the artist Marcel Bruters, who's also a poet, um, taking the poem and just blacking out the words so that you get um, a geometrical space where you can just see the space of the page without the meaning of the words being at issue. And our project then is to convert the pages of the poem into drawing on the precedent of, of Bruter's transformation of the poem and actually to produce a sculptural object that will be about 12 feet high. Um, so here you can see part of the process. We actually went back to study uh, Mallarmé's original manuscripts, which are written on graph paper. So you can get a very precise idea of the exact layout. We reproduced that on graph paper with exactly the same dimensions, um, relayed out the poem, in fact. Um, and then we began to, you can see how precisely uh, uh, Bob Hardy, the person that we were working with is, is working with the language. It's blown up here and you can see exactly where it's going to end in the three dimensional space that we're converting it into. And then it became possible to produce these uh, parallel pipettes, these three dimensional rectangles um, that are like blacking out the the words on the page, except they're um, inscribing the work in three-dimensional space. Um, and then this is the model of just one page of, uh, of the poem. So the idea is to do all of the pages and then to actually have it printed, we'll have to use a larger 3D printer than we have here. It'll have to be a sand printer, um, but that's the idea. It's kind of long-term project. So with both of these projects, there's elements of translation of looking at poetics, not only as it directly relates to language, but um, maybe as a, a strategy for understanding form and, um, and, um, and, and the ways that Doug, it's Doug, I'm just letting you know we cannot hear Cecilia at all. I'm interested in the way that language supplements her research, but it doesn't really inform the, um, the direct object that I'm experiencing here. I guess I'm curious about what is is it important to you that these words return to language or, or what's the, the relationship there between the language? Um, and the Doug, if you could unmute your camera, sure, well, maybe. We I could mean, one easy thing. way of answering that question is that part of the work that Jessica was involved in in producing this object was also writing an essay. Mm -hmm. So studying the historical tradition, studying the concepts, studying the political questions around the transformation of the building in this way. Um, so text remains always, almost always with art in the description of the object, but it's also absolutely crucial um, in thinking about concepts. And this is something that we really emphasize here and why the center is also a place to study philosophy. Every year I teach a, a course on a major work of philosophy. So the idea is that in any of the language that we use to think about 
or to describe Place Ville Marie, to theorize architectural form, there's always embedded concepts, ideologies, political frameworks that are at issue. Um, and in the process of history as well. Um, so here we can see that the language on the page is actually the spatial determination of the object that will be made. And in fact, when we finally produce this, we might leave a layer of text underneath. Uh, these will be stacked up. We might leave a layer of text underneath, see it here a little bit, uh, the, the sculptural form of the three-dimensional rectangles so that people will be able to see the relationship between the language on the page and, and those, uh, um, and that sculptural form. But the idea here is that language is also something which is spatial. It's also something which is material um, and that already has a kind of a visual and material form, even when we're just thinking about poems, for example, by Keats or Wordsworth. Um, so we're trying to draw out that materiality, visuality, and perhaps spatial form of language in some of the projects. Um, Cecilia, do you have a little question? Oh, oh, sure. Sorry about that. Um, 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 Take so, your time. <laughs> um, in terms of working through the, the kind of tradition of experimental poetry, um, which was uh, one of the student questions, how do you see yourself? I mean, I think this project is a good example of kind of building off of that tradition, but also pushing it in different directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, the, so these are some student projects and some collaborative projects that were involved in at the CEP, but I'm also doing independent projects. Some of the books um, that I've written are over here at the end of the table. Um, so the that I published in 2017 is called The Limits of Fabrication, Material Science, Materialist Poetics. And in that book, I'm studying traditions of modernist poetry that conceptualize the poem as a material thing, and therefore as a kind of built object, something which is constructed, a process of material making. And I was comparing that in this volume to scientific processes of making new materials, actually constructing new materials, sometimes even at the nanoscale or at the molecular scale. And so I was thinking about how uh, concepts of form and structure involve those, are involved in those scientific practices, kind of at the limits of fabrication, as I call it, and also how some of those same concepts, ideologies of, uh, of structure and form are involved in experimental poetic practices that conceive of the poem as material. Um, so that's this kind of scholarship that I do, trying to draw out those traditions of experimental poetry and conceptualize them in relationship to other disciplines. In terms of translation, I also just finished a, a translation of Baudelaire's Le Fleur de Mal, The Flowers of Evil. Um, so I've also been working in translation from French into English and thinking about all the conceptual difficulties of the process of translation at that level as well. Um, so I try to draw together the research that I'm doing independently into the collaborative research that we're doing at the lab and let my study of those poetic traditions sort of inform, uh, well, however, you know, students want to develop their own practice and wherever they want to take those traditions. I'm, I'm interested in there's the, the translation of language into other forms, but also questions of very real translation, which I think in Montreal specifically tend to, to dominate a lot of research right. across fields. Um, do you have students or researchers working in, in other languages besides French English, or what's the, the kind of linguistic layout of the, the research group? Uh, interesting question. Well, in fact, um, uh, there was a student, uh, Matteo, who was doing a translation into Italian of HD's modernist poem, Sea Garden. Um, most of the work that we do is primarily in English. Um, it's, it's a lab in the English department. But at the same time, you know, one thing that's interesting about some of these poetic traditions, as you can see here, um, for example, artists in the Russian avant-garde were very important for developing practices of bookmaking and uh, practices of visual poetry that conceived of the poem as a material thing, as a visual object. And so here, you know, even if one can't understand Russian, you can see the impact of, um, of the words on the page, of uh, the books that are made, et cetera. So 
international modernism was very much already a process of translation and mutual influence between a whole constellation of in, in, uh, international artists who didn't necessarily always know one another's languages. Um, and so one thing that I think is valuable about approaching uh, poetry and indeed art in this way is that there can be processes of translation that rely upon other aspects of art making that can sort of traverse different languages. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious to hear more also about, you know, we have, you've got this kind of very nuts and bolts material practice, obviously with the risograph and the archival work, but um, what are the other things that you would consider the, the core materials of the research group? Uh, like how, how would you define the materiality of this, um, this laboratory hmm. in, a, in a more, again, expanded sense? Well, I guess the materiality of the laboratory, uh, let's say we're working between books, um, time-based media like cinema or like digital poetry. Um, so then we have, for example, the touch screen to work on those elements uh, or the projector to screen films. Um, but also, you know, photography is interesting because on the one hand, we do have a suite of cameras um, and also cinema cameras so that people can produce uh, poems at the intersection of text and image, like Alicia Duclos' project on, on Place Ville Marie. And so the medium of photography really is, is light, you know, is vision. Um, and at the same time, we're using digital cameras to scan these old modernist journals um, and reproduce those as digital flipbooks in a new format that's only available, uh, you know, through the mediation of the internet. Um, the risograph is interesting because there the medium is really ink. Um, and what's fascinating about the risograph is it's not a very precise printing technology. Um, there are a lot of registration errors. There's a lot of imprecision in some of the, uh, you know, in, in some of the pages. There's even a possibility that the ink can smudge and smear. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I think that um, designers and artists really value it as a printing technology, you're not, let's say, fully in control of exactly what you'll get out of it. And therefore, there can be a process of sort of productive errors and the reconfiguration of one's practice in order to account for that. Um, so, I mean, I guess in terms of what is the material, well, language, um, but also its translation into images, um, into uh, ink that's at the boundary between, let's say, uh, an image and a word, um, light, if we're talking about photography. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of different uh, materials that are at play. Um, it brings us to another student question about um, the role that publication and publishing plays in kind of um, exploring and pushing the boundaries of these interdisciplinary practices around language. And I'm, you right. know, I'm curious about um, on a really pragmatic level, how the both physical and digital publishing um, furthers the, the projects and, and kind of operates within larger discourse and the kind of the other layers of mediation that end up happening around these projects. Right, right. So, so, so Michael Nardone and I, who edit um, the document series, are really in, informed and influenced by traditions of mimeograph printing, let's say in New York in the 60s and 70s, or the whole tradition of avant-garde bookmaking as well. So one of the thing I think, things that I think is interesting about the context of digital publishing, the sort of mass availability of texts and of books online, is that in a way it sort of opens up um, the publication of books to being very materially specific. Um, so that is to say we can put out a small edition of uh, Slow Scrape or the display, 250 copies. Um, and they can be these kind of fragile, you know, uh, small press books um, printed on the Rizzo. So they're not necessarily, uh, you know, you can see differences, for example, in uh, the weight of the ink on the page from line to line sometimes. And so it's possible to make art books like that. Um, well, it's always possible, but maybe they take on more of a specificity in the, con in, the, in the context of distribution online. So that we could put the PDFs of these books up online when the print run runs out 
and they'll be freely available. Um, and then we can also just do a small edition of, of 250 copies. So, so that's something I think that's kind of opened up by the context of, uh, of online publishing. And in terms of kind of facilitating that discourse, because I think the way that you broke down um, the role language plays in just this project is just returning to your example is a great example of how relationship building and kind of dialogue and person to person interaction mediate so much our understanding of language and form and right. this idea of poetic. So what role does kind of the, the live element, the human element yeah. play in, in promoting this discourse around the publication projects? Yeah, yeah so, so it's very important for me, um, of course, my let's say the, the research that I do that sort of was the ground of starting the center comes out of the study of 20th century experimental poetry and philosophy and, um, and avant-garde art. But it's very important to me to open up practices and projects about things that I don't know about. Um, so I try to make sure that not everything in the center, you know, revolves around my own research. So it's not like, for example, I've never published anything of my own on Place Ville Marie. Um, and so there it was like actually taking up an object that I didn't know that much about, the building, studying it so that I knew enough about it to teach a class, but then really seeing where students would take that without knowing in advance what might develop. Um, so students are bringing a lot of different uh, knowledges and lived experience to the CEP that um, have, you know, produced all sorts of projects that I would never have expected. Um, and that's been a really interesting thing about, uh, about the center for me. And of course, um, people at the lab are, are doing collaborations on their own that don't involve me at all. Um, and also sometimes suggesting speakers or organizing events. And so uh, I try to on the one hand, bring what I have to offer to the table, but also sometimes stay out of the way and, and let students do their own thing. Yeah, the pedagogy is really central, the independent research is central. How, how has this kind of been impacted over the last year? Is there... Well, that's been quite difficult. Yeah. Um, so uh, not much has been going on in the physical space of the center over the past year and a half. Uh, but for example, we did have uh, a digital artist in residence. I can show you that project, actually. It's quite nice. Um, So Stephanie Cregan um, did a remote residency uh, from March to June. So right in the middle of the outbreak of the pandemic, um, producing these sort of cinema poems or poems at the intersection of, of cinema and, and literature. Um, you can see some screenshots here. Uh, and then also writing, uh, publishing each week a new poem on the CEP page. Um, so Stephanie was supposed to do her residency at the CEP uh, using the library and producing you know, new work in relation to the tradition she was studying. Um, but then this became a remote residency and you know, some of the video work that was done works very well for that kind of format. So you know, in some ways um, the pandemic opened up um, some new opportunities. I led, for example, a, a seminar on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit that would have taken place here and probably would have had about 15 students, whereas during the pandemic, it was possible to have 40. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's been a little bit difficult and we're just getting back in the swing of things at the CEP right now. So kind of thinking through, through how language exists in the digital space. We had a question about generative processes and AI, and I'm curious just in a larger sense, how you see um, digital processes, and especially as our culture kind of during the pandemic has shifted into this massively online mode, do you see that affecting the kind of research that people's, people are doing here, or the, the idea of poetics being pushed by the new technologies? I mean, I think that the, the main result of you know the rise of zoom as a technology has been actually you know not that technologically complex but it's certainly opened up a lot of possibilities for collaboration and study between people who are in very different places um, it's much less expensive obviously to uh, do things collectively over zoom than it is in person which is a problem but it's also a, a new kind of possibility but um we also are about to get, uh, actually, I think the technology is arriving now, a sort of new suite of technology for the CEP, which is a web streaming setup. 
um, a sort of three camera uh, web streaming setup that will allow us to do interviews and podcasts. Um, and the plan is to host that also uh, in the lab space and that'll be an ongoing project. And so in a way that that responds to, you know, the new emphasis, let's say on the digital dissemination of research that has, has arisen over the course of the pandemic. You mentioned AI, uh, and it's not really something that, that I work on, but I will mention that my collaborators at Antiism Books, um, the publisher of the document series, they're really interested in the relationship between artificial intelligence and bookmaking. Um, and they've done a number of projects um, uh, bringing that into play in some of the art books that they're producing. So if you go to the Antiism uh, webpage, you can see some examples of the way that they're thinking about the relationship between publishing and artificial intelligence. I'm really intrigued by that. This idea of, um, I guess, one of the, the things that strikes me is that there has been kind of unilaterally a push to just digitize everything right. Right. and how, how and when do we return to the material and um, how does that become a strategic decision, especially because this idea of mediating the discourse, right? You can put everything online, but it doesn't necessarily mean people will read it or interact with right. it or That's true. access it. So, um, I mean, I guess, like, what do you see as the kind of urgency of bookmaking in that context? Yeah, I mean, I think I think, um, I think poetry has always been a marginal art form, for example, compared to cinema um, or even compared to visual art or even compared to the novel. Um, so given that poetry, uh, at least since, let's say, you know, the first few decades of the, of the 20th century, since maybe the rise of cinema has been a very marginal art form, um, I think it's important to attach oneself to also sort of small press practices, marginal practices of art making um, that are kind of collective, um, that are not particularly expensive, that rely more on people's sort of energy and commitment than they do on a lot of money. We have some equipment here at the CEP, but actually the Risograph is an extremely inexpensive um, printing technology. And that's another reason why so many people want to use it. So on Friday, uh, we're going to have our first Risograph workshop since the pandemic, which will be led by Jessica Babinak. And so she'll be training us uh, and some of the new students at the CEP in how to use the, the Risograph. And I'm sure some new collaborations and projects will come out of that as well. So do you see some of the work as being kind of inherently collective in nature when you, when you talk about that as part of small press practices? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, even just even just publishing a book. I mean, you're working with the author, um, you're working with the printer, uh, you're working with the people doing layout and design, you're working with the binders and you're working with distribution. So there's a lot of different elements even of just publishing relatively simple books like the ones that, that we're putting out. And, um, and obviously then, you know, the other context would be something like a year long seminar where one takes a case study like the building plus Phil Marie and makes it an object of mutual investigation and then sees where everyone uh, takes their ideas in different directions. So most things that happen at the CEP are, uh, are collective to one degree or, or another. There's also some more solitary projects like you know, scanning these modernist journals. Um, but then at the same time, there's usually at least three people involved in a project like that, moving back and forth between different elements. So. Um, yeah, we're always learning things from each other. And do you think there's uh, practices of research and creation that have evolved that are kind of unique to this, this lab and this space? Um, well, I don't know if, if anything that we're doing here is entirely unique. You know, there's, there's so much going on in the art world, uh, in experimental literature, et cetera, that you can usually find a precedent for, for everything or somebody else who's doing something very similar. And so for me, it's less important to be doing something completely new um, than just to be uh, developing it, let's say a particular context for what we're doing. So I think one thing that's been specific about the CEP is it's not actually technologically fancy, um, but it's just that we, uh, you know, do these philosophy courses. Um, we have a lot of people coming in giving theory talks. So we try to um, really focus on understanding concepts, um, interrogating concepts, um, thinking about the critique of ideology. 
um, at the same time as we're engaging in these different practices. So maybe the CEP, it's, it's, it's not necessarily anything entirely new. The idea of studying poetry as an interdisciplinary uh, practice um, certainly doesn't derive from this, from this lab. It's essential to modernism. Um, but it's more the, the, um, the project is more to cultivate a context in which it's really possible to do that again, in ways that, that are unexpected. So I wouldn't have thought that textiles would be something that um, was gonna be central to some of the work that's gone on in this lab. There's been a few different textiles projects. Like here's one converting a poetry reading. <laughs> here's one converting a poetry reading into, um, into a textile object that, you know, this, this looks like quite a simple object, but actually it involves all these layers of digital mediation. Um, mapping out the texture of voices, um, uh, different volumes and durations during the poetry reading and converting it into a textile. So, I mean, okay. As a reader, um, at what point do you encounter the object first? Um, and kind of how, how is the the language archived within this object? What is the, what, uh -huh. the reader, what am I reading out of this textile? Right. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about this also because um, we're, we're doing a visit later with textiles and materiality. So there's a lot of like, overlap and, and concern about okay. the idea of shifting things into other forms. Um, okay, well, I can talk a little bit about this project. So this is a project by Joelle Levesque. Um, which was carried out, I believe, in 2016. Well, it was finished 2016. I think it began uh, perhaps in 2015. And one thing that I think this really emphasizes is that there's never any one object within which we can say, like, the artwork exists or the poem exists. So um, this was a reading of Lisa Robertson's book, The Men. So you can say, okay, that book is the book. The language is on the page. But then as soon as you're reading it, you know, even if you're reading it silently or also thinking about it in your own way, interpreting in your own way. Um, but here it was a group reading that went around um, the table and everyone read a page until the book was done. It was recorded. And then you can see um, the mapping, the digital mapping, and even this sort of analog mapping of, um, of the sound recording and the conversion of it into a kind of weaving simulation in a software Poincaré. Um, and then this was done with the digital Jacquard Loom, which is over in, in fine arts. Um, so taking that digital information and uh, turning it into this much sort of rougher, <laughs> but evocative um, textile work. Uh, and you can see all the threads on the back. Um, you can see the texture of the piece here if you click to enlarge. So there's a way in which, you know, the book by Lisa Robertson, The Men, is inscribed in this object, but you can no longer read the words, um, but you can see certain relationships between, yeah, volume, textures of voice, duration. Um, you could even, you know, think about the way that the line breaks or the spacing or the pauses in the poem are inscribed in an object like this. So what I think that shows is just that, yeah, um, texts are always a process of mediation. translation into other forms. And are there any questions from uh, the audience? Uh, yes, there is uh, one question so far from Joya. I can turn up. Will Cecilia be able to read it or would you like me to read it out? We can hear you if you want to read it out. Yeah. You can hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So Joya asks, uh, she'd like to know if there's a place for students who know very few things about poetry in the CEP. Is it also a space to be introduced to the art form? Absolutely. Um, so we used to have poetry readings, like the one that I'm describing here, where we would go around the room and uh, and full volume, reading it aloud. So you wouldn't have to know anything about poetry to participate in that. You'd just have to come and read some pages. 
Um, I do teach undergraduate courses, of course, um, both you know, senior seminars and, and larger uh, lecture courses, uh, introducing students to poetry. Um, but anyone can also just drop by the CEP, make an appointment with me, and, uh, and I'd be happy um, to show anyone some of the different texts and talk through some of the traditions that, that are at issue. Um, but many things that we do here aren't necessarily, let's say, directly related to poetry. There's lots of things being used, uh, being done with the risograph um, that aren't necessarily emerging out of the poem, but they're emerging out of people's print practices. Um, and then, you know, some of us at the lab might be thinking about how those projects are related to poetic traditions, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, that the producers of some of the print projects are. Um, so yeah, we try to keep it open. Uh, to people from different disciplines and who are bringing their own knowledge um, into the center. Uh, well, it has it has been yeah. uh, because of the pandemic. Um, the Cinepoetics group went on for two years, and then it sort of lapsed. And then a few people have done new screening series. We might start one on one Monday evenings, but there's also a student, uh, Maxime Pigeon. Uh, who's been who's just started a, a, a series of film screenings here on Thursday evenings. Um, so yeah, we should revise the <laughs> revive the Cinepoetics uh, series post pandemic. If I can Anna, do we have any other? Sorry. Yep, there is a uh, Brian who thanks Nathan for his time. Thank you for your generosity, Nathan. We appreciate it. Uh, Brian's curious if he could attend um, a, a risograph workshop, if possible. Um, yes, we have uh, we have this one on Friday, which I think is full. But in the future, we'll have other risograph workshops. And you know, again, we're just getting started again, so we'll we'll probably have another workshop in November. And I think we'll have another workshop in January. Um, so you can always contact me right through the CEP page. There's a contact form. Um, and then we can be in touch about setting something up. Yeah. Okay, Anna, are we, uh, we're going to uh, say goodbye to Nathan here and uh, go to you for an outro. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. All right, thanks, Doug. Sorry, I'm just uh, reading something else that's come into the chat here from uh, Rebecca, who's uh, one of the professors um, working with us in this live event, live walkthrough series. So basically, she's inviting <laughs> Nathan to join, join uh, the class for, for drinks <laughs> where they're going after class. So maybe um, we'll send that over to Nathan afterwards. Okay, um, maybe I'll say a, a thank you to, to everybody who joined us over the Zoom. Um, thank you to Nathan for your, the generosity of time and we really appreciate getting this uh, live um, walkabout uh, tour of the facilities. It's been great to, to get up there again and um, just seeing lots of thanks in the chat. So I think on that note, if there is no other kind of further questions, we will close up. And again, uh, we'll remind folks that we do have a, a live stream of this available for all on our YouTube channel. So just look up Concordia University for Space and it should be the first thing that you see there. Okay, on that note, um, we'll close up the Zoom. So thanks everybody, take good care. See you next okay. time. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate your interest. <laughs>